When one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. A woman in the town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. So she came there with an albastar, albaster, yeah. albaster jar of perfume. As she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wipe his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know who this is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two people owed money, a certain money launderer. One owed him 500 dinar and the other 50. Neither of them had money to pay him back, so he forgave the debts of both. Now which one of them loved him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned toward the woman and said to Simon, do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears, wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven little, loves little. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to say among themselves, who is this who has forgiven sins? Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Let's pray as we open this up. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. I ask you, Lord God, that none of us leave here the same as we walked in because we heard from your word this morning. Bless the hearers, Heavenly Father, in us. In Jesus' name, amen. So I wanted to just give you a glimpse. This is by no means uh, an exact only, but I wanted to let you know who the Pharisees were. Because all through the, excuse me, New Testament, you know, we hear about these Pharisees. And so who were they? Where did they come from? And again, this is just a two-minute synopsis on who the Pharisees are, okay? The word Pharisees in Hebrew means separated ones, separated ones. The Pharisees were known to be legalistic and hypocritical. They were legalistic and hypocritical. Pharisees came on the scene during the silent years in the Bible. The silent years are the 400 years between the Old Testament and the New Testament. We call that the silent years. That's when the Pharisees came on the scene. Pharisees dedicated themselves to converting um, Gentiles or non-Jewish people to Judaism. That was their deal. They wanted to convert everyone to Judaism. Pharisees knew the Old Testament. They knew the Torah. The Pharisees were the big shots in the Jewish community with an attitude of superiority. They believed that they were better than anybody and everybody. They were teachers in the synagogues. They seemed, they were, they were seen as the religious examples in the eyes of the people and self-appointed guardians of the law and the proper in the proper way to use the law. So they took the scriptures and said, we are the experts, what we say goes, and that's who they were. Yes, that's the cockiness of who they are. Those were the Pharisees. The Pharisees were enemies of Jesus. Now, I could have read this whole thing. I chose not to. I'm going to give you bits to look up. I want you to write down Matthew chapter 23, Verses 13 to 39. Matthew 23, 13 to 39. I'm going to give you bits of all of those verses, okay? Because this is Jesus talking to the Pharisees. This is Jesus talking to the Pharisees. 
Jesus calls them hypocrites six times in verse 13, 15, 23, 25, 27, and 29. Jesus calls the Pharisees hypocrites. Jesus calls them children of hell. Children of hell. That's in verse uh, 15. He calls them blind. That's in verse 16, 17, 19, 24, and 26. They were blind to the needs of the people. They were blind to grace. They were blind to just being a normal person. They were that group of people. They were superior. Jesus calls them whitewashed tombs. You'll see that in verse 27. He calls them a brood of vapors. A, vo a brood of vapors. He says that in verse 33. Jesus tells them in verse 23, you lead people astray. You lead people astray. You come as the, as the experts on the law, and you lead them astray. Let's get into the text. Luke 7, verse 36. Now one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him. So he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. Many theologians believe the motives of the Pharisee was to entrap Jesus. He was trying to entrap him at some way, not learn from him. The Pharisee's motives were not to spread the good news. The Pharisee's motives was to puff himself up. To puff himself up. We learn in verse 40, the Pharisee's name is Simon. Simon couldn't help himself. He needed to invite this controversial rabbi to his house. He needed to invite this controversial rabbi. Because remember, Jesus disrupted the norm. It started with John the Baptist, but Jesus was not a normal rabbi. He disrupted things. Now here's a little back history of the Bible times, okay? Okay. The home of Simon was considered rich. In the Bible times, the rich always had an open courtyard in the middle of their house. They had an open courtyard in the middle of their house. Many times, the host would allow the public to stand around the courtyard and listen to their guest. So picture this, okay? You are conceded to the innermost being. So now you're inviting Jesus to recline at the table, and you invite the public to stand in the courtyard and listen to the, um, the conversation. You're not feeding them. They're watching you eat. But they're listening to the conversation. We will find out later in this text just how much Simon actually disrespected Jesus. He actually disrespected Jesus. Let's move on. Verses 37 and 38. When a woman who had lived a sinful life in that town learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, she bought an alabaster jar of perfume. And as she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. Doesn't that just stop you? Have you ever had a, a party or a function at your home and somebody unexpected shows up? And the person who's unexpected shows up, you don't want them there. Not with this group of people. You don't want them there. Well, here comes girlfriend. Yikes, an unexpected guest shows up as she is a sinful woman. In other words, in other words, she was either a prostitute or a boy toy. Take your pick. She was a sinful woman. This woman heard Jesus was having dinner at the Pharisee's house. She brought with her probably the most expensive thing she owned. The most expensive thing she owned, an alabaster jar of perfume. Now, the alabaster jar in itself is not fancy. It's just what it's called. I looked it up to see modern day and, and ancient alabaster jars. And they're just clay pots. There's nothing really fancy or funky about them. They're just what they call an alabaster jar. 
Weeping at Jesus' feet speaks volumes. Now, get, don't miss this. Weeping at Jesus' feet speaks volumes of her understanding her sinful state and the holiness of the Savior. She understood where she stood. She understood her own sin. She understood it. She was in the presence of the Messiah, and she understood her state, her sinful state. This woman truly gave all... Now listen to this, because sometimes we read the, the things in the Bible and we blow it off or we just keep on reading. But I want you to take a minute here and understand something. This woman truly gave all she had to Jesus. She gave all she had to Jesus. The alabaster jar represented her physical wealth. The jar with the perfume, perfume has never been cheap. Guys, we buy perfume for my wives. You ever buy a cheap bottle? Not the ones that smell good. So she had given to Jesus perfume in an alabaster jar. That represented her prized possession, guys. Think about that. She gave her all. This woman laid her soul at the feet of Jesus and showed how incredible love by kissing his feet. Don't we kiss the loved ones that we have? Don't we? When my father was last in Boston, back in May, and he came to Boston, a very sick man, as you know, he passed on August 3rd. He came to Boston, a very sick man, and I knew when I brought him to Logan Airport that that would be the last time that I saw my dad. He was that weak, and I kissed him on the cheek, and I said, Dad, I love you. And I hugged him at the airport, and he looked at me, and he said, I love you too, Lawrence. And as I left the airport, I cried like a baby all the way to my car because I knew I knew I wasn't going to see him again so when we kiss our loved ones that is huge that is a sign that we love them we kiss them on the forehead and we kiss them on the cheek we just hug them and love them well that's what she was doing to Jesus she gave him all that she had and then she loved him up. Openly. Openly. This woman was in, depress was in a uh, depression. This woman was in desperation. Girlfriend was gripped with lostness, helplessness, and pain-stricken because of her own sin. She was in the presence of holiness. She was in the presence of the Messiah. She knows what kind of life she leads. And she was in his presence. And she had a real sense of just who she was in the presence of God. So much so that she is weeping at his feet and drying his feet with her hair. Do you know how much tears that is? Don't us guys try to hide the tears? We try to hide our tears. Uh, yesterday, yesterday, our oldest grandson, Anthony, he's the starting center for the JV Stoughton High football team. And I went to his game. He's number 54. And I watched my grandson trot out there. And, and I am sitting there, and I'm bawling. I'm just bawling that I got an opportunity to see him play. He's playing at the school that I graduated from, and there he was. Guys, if you don't take advantage of the things that God has given you on a daily basis, you're missing the boat. Scripture tells us that tomorrow is not promised to us. We need to start living like we understand that and believe that. 
We get the opportunity in our lives to do things with our children. Dude, do it. It was awesome. I watched the entire game in the rain. They lost 26 to 20. She gave all she had. This woman, here are a couple of Bible verses, not if, not if, but when we find ourselves in a state of desperation. Not if you're in a state of desperation, but when all of us are going to have times where we're just clinging on. We're just holding on. We don't know what's even expected tomorrow. All I know is I'm holding on to this string in Jesus' robe for today. And I'm holding on for dear life. That's what this woman was. Psalm 34, 18. Psalm 34, 18. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. When we find ourselves in desperation, it ain't time to go to the bar. It ain't time to call a friend to make you feel better. It is time to get on your knees and to open your word. If you don't know where to go, remember, there's a huge secret. I don't know if I told you the secret before, but let me tell you the secret of where to go in the Bible. Google, give me Bible verses on feeling depressed. Until you learn your Bible. Go to what God has given us to build us up. That's where we go. As followers of Jesus Christ, we have to learn that the Bible not just is in our lifeline, it's our life. It's everything. Matthew 20, 11, 28. Come to me, all those who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I will give you rest. How comforting when we're in the state of really desperation. But one, as I was going through this, I, I came across this and I thought, that's perfect. The perfect verse that fits this sinful woman in this morning's text. This is the perfect verse that fits exactly where she is and what she did. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 to 16. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 to 16. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess for we are not we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are yet was without sin let us approach the throne of grace with confidence with confidence guys what is your mental aspect when you have to go to the scriptures? It needs to be with confidence. I know I'm going to find what I'm looking for. I know Jesus is going to give me the answer. I know through the Holy Spirit he's going to build me up. I know I'm having a hard time right now. But I also know, because Jesus is my Savior, that it's not forever. The rest of the verse. So that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. That's exactly what this woman did. Exactly what she did. Verse 39. When the Pharisees who had invite when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know who he who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. Did you catch that? Did you catch that? Did you catch the self-righteous attitude of Simon here? The self-righteous attitude. If this man were a prophet, so now he's in the presence of the Messiah. He is in the presence of God. 
This Pharisee has read all about him because to become a Pharisee, you had to memorize the book of Isaiah. That was part of it, becoming a Pharisee. This Pharisee knew the book of Isaiah. And he's standing in the presence of the Son of God. And he's sitting there saying, if this man was a prophet. Do you see how far superior Pharisees thought they were? He would know who was touching him. Simon said these things to himself. Don't miss this. It was a heart thing. Simon was sharing his heart. He was sharing his heart. That's who he was. What does the Bible say about our hearts? Here's a couple of scriptures for you. Ezekiel 36, 26. Ezekiel 36, 26. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. Which heart did Simon have? It was stone. It was stone. Proverbs 10.8. The wise in heart accept commands, but the chattering fool comes to ruin. I like that one because you're going to see how much of a chattering fool he is as we move on in the text. This Pharisee considered himself better than Jesus and definitely better than this sinful woman. Definitely better than her. Simon sensed no need for forgiveness or any reason to repent because he didn't see himself as a sinner. There's no reason for me to repent. Have you ever met someone like that? I have a patient. You know, I'm a chaplain right now for the next couple of months. And I had a patient that I visit. And she has no faith. And so I asked her, I said, so when life gets really tough, what do you do? How did, how did you make it this far? This woman's in her 80s. Well... I just looked in the mirror and said, I'm going to do this, and I depended on myself. And I thought, wow. 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 Really? I said, how do you do that? How do you do that? Did you raise your, your children in the church? No. No. But one of my sons is married to some Christian. Does he go to church? She goes, yeah, I run Christmas. Very proud to say that. Guys, there are people all around us who are blinded. They are living in this world according to what they believe and think. And until we invite them to church or until we engage them, we need to be a body that engages people and pray for their salvation. Pray for their salvation. I got in my car and I started praying for her salvation. Simon sensed no need for forgiveness or even reason to repent. He saw himself as better on the religious front and on the behavioral front. I'm better because I am who I am and I teach the Torah and I'm not a sinner like her. Simon also believed that this unclean woman touched Jesus, which makes Jesus presume to be ceremonially unclean if he weren't the Savior. If he weren't the Savior. So here's what the Bible says about the self-righteous attitude. Here's a couple of verses on a self-righteous attitude. Because if that is you, if you're hearing me today, if you have a heart that is self-righteous, I can't help it, Pastor. I can't help it. Yes, you can. 
You can ask the Lord, change my heart, oh God. You can ask the Lord. See, here's a couple of verses. Mark 7, verse 6. Mark 7, verse 6. He replied, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. As it is written, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They honor me with their lips, and their hearts are far from me. Do you know when the biggest time this scripture is true? Across America, Sunday morning, Sunday morning, people are in all kinds of churches honoring God with their lips, and their hearts are far from them. How do I know this is true? Look at the state we're in. Just take a look at the state we're in. We don't want to be that. We don't want to be a, a mouth that praises God in a heart that doesn't know him. Titus chapter 1, verses 16, 15 and 16. Titus 1, 15 and 16. To the pure, all things are pure. But to those who are corrupt and do not believe, nothing is pure. In fact, both their minds and consciences are corrupt. They claim to know God, but by their actions, they deny him. What's that word? By their actions. Don't tell me you love me. Show me. Don't tell me you love me. Show me. And by the way, guys, showing love means showing up. That's part of it. When we have loved ones that's going through a hard time, an operation or something is happening, many people won't go because they say, I don't know what to say. And you know what I say to them? Say nothing. Show up. Hug that brother or sister. Cry with that brother or sister. You don't have to say a dong on thing. The fact that you are there shows how much you love them. Stop trying to think that you got to be a conversationalist. When your presence with them and their time of desperation means more than any words you can say. Any words. So let's stop complicating our faith. Let's stop putting practical, biblical principles to work. Verses 40 to 43. Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two men owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii, the other 50. Neither of them had money to pay him back. So he canceled the debts for both. Which one of them will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt canceled. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. You have judged correctly. Can you imagine the environment in the room when Jesus said, Simon, I have something to tell you? Remember, there's people in the courtyard. There's people in the courtyard. Simon, I have something to tell you. It's easy to forget that when we read these, these stories in the Bible, that Jesus is the Son of God. He's a 100% man and a 100% God. That never changed. Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus knew everything on their minds. He knew everything on Simon's mind. He knew everything on the people in the courtyard's mind. He knew everything. Isaiah 11, 2 says this. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding. The spirit of counsel, of power. The spirit of knowledge. This was talking about John the Baptist, talking about Jesus. Now we know that Jesus knew everything. John 16, 30. John 16, 30. Now we can see that you know all things and that you do not even need to have anyone ask you a question. 
This makes us believe that you are from God. You are from God. I wanted to throw those that in there for people who don't, who don't believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I just wanted to throw that out there. Verses 40 to 44 to 50. Verses 44 to 50. Then he turned toward the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman, from the time I entered, has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she, was, she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, for she loved much. But he who has been forgiven little loves little. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to say amongst themselves, who is this who forgives sins? Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Now that exchange was a slam on Simon. Was a slam on Simon. You see, Simon just looked at this woman as a sinner. But he couldn't even give Jesus the courtesy like they do. In that day, when you were invited to someone's home, first off, there were no cars, there were no buses, there were no trains. You walked. Only the soldiers or the very rich even owned a horse. So you walked everywhere. When you entered someone's house, they had either if they were rich, someone there to wash your feet. Because your feet were dirty. You were either wearing sandals or nothing. Jesus came to Simon's house. Simon didn't offer him any feet cleaning. Nothing. Nada. Total disrespect. And Jesus let him have it. Jesus cut to the quick forcing Simon to look at his heart of self-righteousness and sinfulness. Yet didn't offer me water to wash my feet. You didn't offer me oil. When you had someone royal in your home, sometimes they would pour oil over your feet or oil over your head as a sign of respect and love. And he didn't do that. Jesus takes the opportunity to put the lack of respect shown by Satan on front street. He put it on front street. No water to wash my feet. You didn't hug me or kiss me when I walked into your home. Really? Do we not greet our guests when they come? Do we not give them a handshake or a, a fist pump or a, a hug? And in my case, with my girls, a kiss every time? Every time. Fathers, instill that now. Okay? When my daughters, when we were raising our daughters and I came home from work, I wanted my kiss. When my daughters come into my house, they make a beeline to my cheek. Dong on straight. Because those are my girls. But we greet people who come to our home, don't we? Aren't, we're glad they're there. They could be anywhere. They, they picked your home. We greet them with love. We make sure that there is plenty to drink, whatever you want. We make sure that our guests need for nothing. And Simon did none of that. Then Jesus blows Simon away, saying, Therefore, her many sins have been forgiven. Why did Jesus do this? Why did Jesus, out of all that he could have done, all of a sudden, say to this sinful woman, Your sins are forgiven? Because he wanted to prove to 
this Pharisee, Simon, that he was the Messiah. Because Simon knew that God is the only one that has the power to forgive sin. So when Jesus said, your sins are forgiven, that was a right cross to the cheek. I am the Messiah. I can forgive sin. He is the Savior of the world and the power to forgive sin. Right up there in Simon's camp. Jesus gives the answer straight to Simon. This woman loved much, but he who has been forgiven little loves little. Simon hasn't been forgiven because Simon hasn't asked, because Simon believes he doesn't have to be forgiven, because he's self-righteous. See, that's the problem that self-righteous people have. Don't forget, as this scene is taking place, the other guests, the folks in the courtyard watching and listening as the entire scene unfolds before their eyes. Everyone at dinner witnessed the forgiveness of sins by the Messiah himself. You ever think about that? Everyone in the courtyard at dinner witnessed the Messiah given the forgiveness of sins right there. Boom! Drop the mic. Acts 5.31 says this, God exalted him to his right, own right hand as prince and savior that he might give repentance and forgiveness of sins, of sins to Israel. Don't you just love the Bible in action? <laughs> right then and there, in front of everybody. Ephesians 1.7, in him we have redemption through his blood the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches, riches of God's glory. According to God's glory. Please stand for your walking away thought. This is a powerful piece of scripture this morning because it forced us to take a look at our own hearts. Do we walk around like Simon the Pharisee in the text, believing we are better than other people because of our position, education, economic status? Let's stop seeing people as objects and start seeing people as souls in the need of a savior. Have the courage to invite someone to church or to one of the ministry events. Let us really start praying for the lost people in our lives and in around us. And let's really start praying for their salvation and that they may come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. That the Lord Jesus Christ turns their heart of stone to a heart of flesh. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we praise you and we thank you for our time together. We thank you, Heavenly Father, as we are continuing our walk through the book of Luke. I ask you, Heavenly Father, that you continue to grow us. Help us, Lord God. If there is any hint of a hard heart in some areas of our life, I ask you, Heavenly Father, to work on those areas. All of us got stopped. All of us. So help us, Heavenly Father, by and through your word, that every day we get closer to the righteousness and the goodness of our faith. In Jesus' name, amen.